Hi, I'm Joe Scott. This is a lightning round video. I'm drinking coffee. I need a haircut. And, uh, I, I, I didn't really, I didn't really plan an intro for this, so, um, Robin asked, During my landing approach to beautiful Scottsdale last month, I was surprised by the vast number of swimming pools I could see throughout the Phoenix area. I was, however, surprised that I was seeing few pool covers. In an area threatened by severe water shortage, is this just a drop in the bucket? Does it matter or not? You know, for somebody who's really bad at math, I do, uh, I do kind of love these things. Because I bet I could actually answer that. Like, I, I want to work that out. So of course this sent me down a rabbit hole. Uh, but I want to show my math and, and show you how I got to this answer. I think it's a pretty good answer. So let's, let's follow me to the rabbit hole. It's where the math is. Okay, so first I had to figure out the number of pools in Phoenix. And she mentioned Scottsdale and Phoenix, but I went with Phoenix for this thought experiment. But anyway, according to this, from the Morrison Institute at Arizona State University, they say that two-thirds of homes don't have pools. That means that one third of them do. Okay, so I look at the number of homes in Phoenix, according to the United States Census Bureau, the number of homes is 626,977. That would make the number of homes with pools 208,979. Okay, so now we have to figure out how much gets lost to evaporation from the average pool. So for that, we need to find the average pool size. So I started looking around and I got a whole bunch of different charts of different pool sizes. And this website says the average size of a rectangular pool is 10 feet by 20 feet at the low end of the scale, 20 feet by 40 feet at the larger end. <laughs> larger end. And I think that shakes out. I was looking at these charts of different pool sizes and I saw those a lot on the size chart. So if we're looking for an average size, we can split the difference here and you get 15 by 30 feet. By the way, I know everybody in the non-America parts of the world are cringing right now, but these were the units that I found this information in and I'm already doing enough math. I didn't want to have to convert it all over again. So just bear with me. The point still stands. In fact, I got it to liters as fast as I could, but then I realized that it wasn't really about how much was in the pools, it was about how much is evaporating. So that's when I happened on this site that says, water evaporation rates vary based on water temperature, air temperature, wind speed, wind volatility, sun exposure, and humidity levels. The average pool water evaporation rate is about a quarter of an inch per water per day, or more than two inches per week, which on a 33 by 18 foot swimming pool, average pool size, according to this, this checks out with what I was saying before. Uh, this is more than 2,500 liters or approximately 600 gallons a week. This may vary depending on your climate and the factors listed above. Okay, so here comes the caveat. I, I got this information from a website for a company called Catch a Kid and they make pool covers to catch kids so they don't fall into the pool. Uh, now, so they're using this as part of their marketing. So it is fair enough to assume that maybe they are bumping the size of these pools and the evaporation rates up a little bit to sell things, but I think that is also equaled out by the fact that we are talking about Phoenix, possibly the hottest and driest city in all of North America, so it's probably going to be on the high end. That's probably where we need to be. So I think there's some wiggle room on this one, but I think my logic is sound, so I'm going with it. All right, so here comes the math, and I did go ahead and look ahead to see like what unit this would need to be in in order to make an apples and apples comparison, and it turns out it needs to be in acre feet which is an absurd measurement. Uh, it's a volume of water one squared acre wide and one foot deep. This probably ranks about number five on the list of most American units of measurements ever. So according to the website, 600 gallons per week, that comes out to 85.7 gallons per day. As I established before, there are roughly 208,979 pools. That comes out to 17,893,902.9 gallons a day. Yikes. For a year, multiply by 365, and you get 6,531,274,558.5 gallons per year. That sounds like a lot, and it doesn't get much better when you put it into acre feet. It comes out to 20,043.74 acre feet per year, lost to evaporation. But how does that factor into the overall equation? Well, I found another blog from Arizona State University. It says that 2.3 million acre feet per year are consumed in the Phoenix area. And I did a little math, figured out that 20,000 acre feet of water is about 0.87% of 2.3 million. So for perspective, that looks like this. So in the great scheme of things, is this a big deal? I mean, it's not nothing. The first video I made at the beginning of this year was about the Colorado River crisis and guys, it, it's bad. So maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, get pool covers. Come on, Phoenix. Get your pool covers. 
I wonder if they make solar pool covers, because then you can make some energy along with it. That would be cool. Just don't, you know, get electrocuted. I've been way too close to this camera this whole time. <laughs> Mark Hoffman also asked, quite a few studies have been released recently showing the benefits of psilocybin on mental health. Any input you'd care to share, personally, professionally, or otherwise? How much can I talk about this without getting demonetized? Uh, okay, so... <laughs> before I talk about this, um... Any kids might want to go find something else to, to watch. Um, uh, Mom, skip forward, please. Um, I have had one psilocybin experience in my life, and I will say it was quite positive for me. I won't go into the details. I'll just say that I had some with a significant other at the time, and uh, uh, I just I don't remember a whole lot from it. I remember winding up walking through our apartment parking lot and seeing a cat and being like, whoa. I also remember at one point walking through that parking lot saying out loud, this is like the greatest adventure I've ever been on. So, you know, your basic drug story. But I will say this, um, again, not getting the specifics because I'm not here to air dirty laundry, but at the time with this particular significant other, I was having some issues, some insecurities, that were really affecting the relationship and making me unhappy and I was really upset about this and uh, it was just something I just couldn't quite shake and everything and we had this experience and I woke up the next day and not only was I not upset about that anymore I literally could not remember why I ever was upset about it like I just didn't even know why that bothered me and that pretty much stuck um, I will say that it did creep back in a little bit more later on, like it wasn't just gone forever, but it was never at the level that it was before. And it took months before it, that started to creep back into my psyche and everything. So, I mean, I definitely understand why people advocate for it. And I, I think if you're really stuck on something, uh, a psilocybin type treatment would be exceedingly helpful. But I also understand why um, it's it's, it, you really have to be careful with it. I mean, my experience was really positive, but I could also see how it could go in the opposite direction. You know, I think things could just spiral uh, out of hand if, you, if you're not, you know, in control of what's going on. That's why they, they talk about these guided trips, if you will. Um, I think that could be really beneficial. Um, I, am, I am for it. So, uh, but I will also say, if you're, if you're young... Um, you know, don't, don't get messed up in this kind of stuff too early because your brain is still gelling and I think that it can kind of, uh, you know, push things in, in ways that aren't good. My two cents, anyway. Cole Parker asked, Hey Joe, this might need to lean on your space friends like Tim and Scott to answer, but could they launch the dragon on the Falcon Heavy and send it on a flyby of the moon? Or could they add two more boosters to get stuff into lunar orbit? I know you meant boosters, but I said it like that anyway. Cause, Cause I'm an asshole. asshole. So I thought about answering this, but then I realized that Cole's right. I have friends that could answer this far better than I could. Um, so why not bring them on board? So everybody, I want to say this is your lucky day. I have special guest stars, both Tim Dodd and Scott Manley here to answer this question. I'm just gonna hand this off to them and sit back, take a break and have a drink of coffee. So guys, have at it. I mean, yeah. Yes. Oh. Um. Okay, uh. Thanks, guys. So I guess I'll, I'll fill in the gaps, but, uh, yeah, it, they totally could. It is technically feasible. Uh, there are some caveats, though. And I will refer to this article that I found from Ars Technica that talks specifically about this. Um, this was from uh, August of 2020, so got a couple of years on it. And this actually links to another opinion piece from Robert Zubrin of the Mars Society and Homer Hickman, who's an author of Rocket Boys in October Sky, and a retired former NASA astronaut trainer. Um, so this is kind of based off of their opinion. I'll put the links to both of those down below, but there have been people that have been advocating 
exactly for this because we have a crew rated vehicle that has been proven at this point. Orion still has some ways to go, still has a lot of testing to do. Um, obviously we have the SLS launch coming up in the next hopefully few months, but um, there have been people that have been making the arguments like we already have a crew rated vehicle, why don't we just go ahead and use it? Why spend the money that it's gonna take to, to do what we're doing here? And again, Technically, yes, it could be done. It, it, I don't think that you would need any extra boasters or boosters for the uh, Falcon Heavy to get it up around the moon. It could handle it, no problem. But again, some caveats. First of all, Falcon Heavy is not currently human rated. Now they could get it there, but um, it would take a lot of extra time and, and effort. And really SpaceX has kind of stopped uh, developing the Falcon 9 vehicle. They're moving on completely to Starship. So um, there's not really, nobody's gonna be paying for that or anything. Now there was an idea where um, they actually launched the crew on a regular Falcon 9 Crew Dragon trip, just like they're doing right now, but then they launch a propulsion module up on the Falcon Heavy, they dock in orbit, and then that propulsion module takes them out to the moon. And that way, everything that's human rated is already human rated, and they don't have to like go through any extra whatever. So there would need to be some upgrades to the Crew Dragon in order to make it moon worthy. Um, first of all would be its communication system. It uses the current GPS system around Earth right now, so they would need to upgrade that for, for a lunar mission. Also radiation shielding, and what they're talking about in the article is that it's not even so much for the humans in there, obviously they would want to protect the humans as much as possible, but it's really for more the delicate instruments that are on the Crew Dragon, uh, the, the electronics, those, those have to be protected really. The other thing, and this probably isn't that big a deal, but it would be a bit of a tight fit for four people for the duration that would be required to get to the moon and back, um, what was it, like two weeks or so? Although I think, I think it's actually bigger than the original Apollo capsule. Now on the plus side, it is half the weight of the Orion vehicle. Um, and the launch cost would be more around the 100 million to 200 million range, as opposed to 2 billion for the SLS. So yeah, I mean, that's the argument that they're making in the articles. Like we already have the hardware to do this, to get people up there. Why spend the extra money on all this other stuff? But with SpaceX not really, iterating on the Falcon 9 anymore, um, and we're already so far into SLS. I mean, they could maybe still do it if they wanted to. Um, it actually turns out that SpaceX once did have what they called the Gray Dragon, which was a lunar version of the, the Dragon capsule, and a Red Dragon, which was for Mars. They've kind of scrapped all that for Starship, so um, yeah, they're, they're going all in on that. But yes, they could do it. It could be a thing, but there's lots of reasons why it probably won't be. And speaking of space hardware, today's sponsor makes space hardware you can use on your face. Seriously, this Razer was manufactured in a shop that made parts for the Perseverance rover. That's kind of the company's origin story, which is one of my favorite things about them. They were basically a machine shop that worked on aerospace equipment, and then one of them had a unique idea for a Razer, and they just kind of spun off a new business, Henson Shaving. I talked about Henson about a month ago or so, and I guess I just must have put the right words in the right order, because I got a lot of people writing me saying that they got one, men and women. Was it because I called you Harry? But yeah, I've been using it ever since myself, and I won't lie, it's a little bit of an adjustment using safety razors, but I like it. Oh, and to the guy in the comments that told me that I was a liar because I was talking about using a razor when I have a beard, um, do you think the hair just stops right there? But yeah, I've become a really big fan of this, and you know what, I just walk around my house now and I just find these old cartridges everywhere. There's another one right over there. Yeah, I've got two of these in my office for some reason. Yeah, I used to be part of a uh, shall not be named subscription company, and I've just got tons of these things laying around because I don't really shave that much. Actually, how many, how many of these do I have? Look at this. This is insane. Look at all these. Yeah, I just fell behind on my razors and these just like piled up. And, and each one of these are $2 each. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six times four. That's 24 times two, that's $48 worth of razors here. With Henson, you get a hundred of these safety razors for only $10. Actually, you can get them totally for free, a hundred of them, if you enter the code Joe Scott at checkout. Oh, just make sure and add the 100 pack to your order. Um, just some people found that out the hard way. But seriously, I look at this now and I just, ah, I just, I feel so much shame, so much waste, so much plastic, money and plastic. These are 10 cents each and completely recyclable. In fact, Henson doesn't shave these. I feel like they should, but I bought a little, uh, razor, I didn't barely even see the, 
that's the thing there. I bought a little razor container. I just keep this in the shower. When I'm done, I just pop them in there. And when I'm done with the whole thing, I'll just recycle the whole thing. And by the way, if you're a little bit nervous about using a safety razor, you think that you get probably a better shave with five skinny blades. Well, you've probably never shaved with a razor designed by aerospace engineers out of aerospace grade aluminum to be a perfect 30 degree angle supported all the way across to a depth of 27 microns. Yeah, the way the blade is supported in these razors is so precise that one edge can cut as well as five poorly supported blades. Anyway, assuming that you're a hairy, hairy mammal, I recommend giving Henson Shaving a try. You do get a free 100 pack of razors when you sign up with the code Joe Scott, uh, which by the way, I did the math in the last video. That's like a year and a half supply of these things. And it also just kind of feels like you're supporting cool people that are doing cool things in the world. I mean, these guys made things that are on Mars right now. Anyway, it's HensonShaving.com. Link is down in the description. Go check it out. And thanks to Henson for supporting this channel and for just being cool people. All right, Fishtail asks, what are some of your pet peeves about what science educators like yourself do? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna throw any shade. Um, mostly the things that, that bug me that other people do are just kind of like in their delivery, in their presentation. Um, and some of that is just personal preference. Um, so, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the things that bug me. Um, my least favorite thing that especially science and educators do on YouTube is the term UC. I actually say this to my writers, this channel is a no UC zone. We are sans youth UC. Like you always see people in the, in the, in the videos are like, you know, blah, 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 blah. You see, this is the reason why da, 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 da. And, and like, to me, it's just a very condescending term. It just, I, I don't know a way of saying it that doesn't sound condescending. I don't think that the people who use it are meaning to be condescending. It's a very just regular phrase, but to me, it's always like, you see. So yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that I hear and just kind of, ah. Mostly the things that bother me in, in terms of the way other people do their channels is in the voice cadence. Like I feel like sometimes, especially when people script out their stuff or if they're just kind of reading it over B-roll or that kind of thing, um, I feel like some creators sort of forget that they're, they're talking in a conversational style and they sort of read every line with the exact same cadence and after a while it starts to just drive me crazy. I will not be naming any names here. There, there's one channel where the guy ends every sentence like this. It kind of does this da-da-da, da-da-da at the end of every sentence. So, you know, uh, I'm sitting here at my desk and I picked up some drink and I took a drink of the drink and then I walked out of the room and it's like, oh, stop it. Uh, and there's a spooky pasta guy. He's not really a science communicator, but but he does the same thing. I, I don't even remember the name of it. I'm sure you guys know who it is, but but like, he ends every he ends every sentence like this. He does this creepy thing where he talks and everything sounds like this. And I know that for that guy specifically, that's just like that's just like his thing. It's clearly just a part of his channel. And this might just be a personal thing, but it just drives me nuts. And last but not least, in terms of like specifically what science communicators do sometimes, is I think with this is something that I struggle with too. Um, science communication can get into word salad really quickly. You know, you use a lot of technical terms uh, when you're talking about science stuff. And for an average viewer, um, a lot of times, if you hear too many technical terms in a row and you're still trying to kind of figure out what exactly each one of those things are, you can get lost real quick. So it's a really big thing for me that whenever I start to get into those like technical word salads that I back up a little bit and kind of slow things down and make sure I kind of make sure everybody knows what each of these Lego pieces are before I build the whole thing. And there are some science communicators that um, aren't as receptive to that, or they don't, they don't pay as much attention to that. So they can just kind of like get right into the word salad. And then I just get completely lost. I'm like, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. But that's just, that's just one of those challenges of doing the, the science communication. And last but not least, John Regal asked an important question. This may be too hot to touch, but what is your stance regarding pineapple on pizza? I mean, I've had Hawaiian pizza before and you know, the, the ham and pineapple thing. I mean, it's, I don't hate it. I don't hate it, but I never order it. But that's probably because whenever you order pizza, you're usually with other people <laughs> and other people always hate it. So I never do get it. So no, I haven't had one in years, but I didn't, I didn't hate it when I had one. Kind of want one now. Big thanks to Henson Shaving for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are keeping this channel running and the lights on and forming an awesome community, some of which get their questions answered in these lightning round videos, which by the way, if there's something in here that you want it to be expanded on, I could do a full expansion, but let me thank some Patreon supporters real quick. We got Jonathan, Brittany Ristiano, uh, Edward Civex, you got me, Daniel Johansson, Sarah B, John Fletcher, Femi Fox, Lord Helmet, uh, Kevin Beach, Sam Sayer, and Fiss. 
Well, there you go. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, and just be part of an awesome community, you know you gotta go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. I really wasn't trying to rhyme that, but... Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Maybe I'll link to another lightning round video if you like it. Um, and uh, go check it out, whatever. Uh, there's others over here on the side that have my face on them. Go check them out. And if you like what I do and you want to see them when they first come out, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, cool, guys. Hope that was fun for you. You guys go out there now. Have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Love you guys. Take care.